hypotheses of what exactly those are. Uh, and so generally speaking, you can't necessarily define a competency uh, and use that definition to apply to all different types of competencies because they vary so, so much. But um, if you think about it broadly speaking, you can uh, think of competencies as things that are categorized as either a skill, uh, based knowledge, or disposition. Um, and we kind of use the skill and knowledge as one style for competencies, and the disposition-based competencies as another style. Um, so if you look at this diagram here, we kind of use the idea of the nucleus, uh, nucleus um, to point out the significance of the formational or disposition-based competencies that we're going to be discussing. Um, so as you see out here, the skills and knowledge-based competencies are kind of things that have a clear yes, you can do them or no, you can't. So uh, to you know, give a quick example, that would be something like uh, computer science and coding. You can, be, you can either uh, use code to write an HTML or you can't. It's kind of a yes or no. Whereas these formational competencies are kind of harder to define, and there would be kind of broader kind of conceptual um, competencies like leadership capabilities, teamwork, and things of that nature. Uh, so now Sumit is going to go into scenario planning. Yeah, so we stuck with the same scenarios that we talked about last time. Uh, we went with the three axis model of individually curated versus institu institutionally curated education, um, integrated versus granular, integrated being the bodies of knowledge that we currently have. Uh, Georgetown, for example, and granular would be like pockets of dollars you can get from a boot camp, such as Vladimir or the General Assembly. Um, and then qualitative versus quantitative feedback. So quantitative feedback would mostly be through algorithms or through just for example, the GPA system we have now, versus qualitative, which is actual feedback from mentors or faculty. Uh, so we looked at three uh, emergent university systems. Uh, one of them is Minerva, which we talked a bunch about. Minerva is kind of like the traditional university that is integrative and has kind of a mix of quantitative and qualitative, um, more so qualitative like we have now, where basically you can get get an answer of what why you got a grade, for example, in a certain even though it's just online. Uh, another thing would be Flatiron. It's also institutionally created, but it's very granular. So you're only focused on building your, uh, for example, your coding competency. Um, and everything's quantitative. It's more of like uh, how well you just did something you don't like. If you either you got it right or you didn't get it, the code right. Um, and then Capella is also something we talked about. Capella is quantitative in that you're basically testing, you're only taking tests about what competencies you know. However, it is integrated in that you are still getting like a degree, for example. It's just more competency focused. Um, so the point of showing these three different uh, scenarios and these, uh, or sorry, these three different emerging universities is that there's not really one clear future university. It's more so kind of based in uh, mixed in these scenarios. Um, however, there is clearly room for the traditional university to grow and change. So, so with that being said, um, our big question is really how can uh, traditional universities stay relevant um, as this uh, education system changes so dramatically. Um, and we believe that the traditional university has to focus on these three things. Uh, curating sources of testable knowledge and skills, that's a lot of what things like Flatiron and Code Academy are doing. Um, those are the kind of base outside of the nucleus um, competencies that we were talking about. Um, things that are easily testable. Uh, providing the first personal connections something that uh, we believe the traditional university is, has almost a, a unique ability to do is bring together groups of like-minded and um, intelligent people to have conversations that we do here at Georgetown. Um, and then formational competencies, which is really what we're going to spend most of our, um, most of our presentation on. The quote here it says, What does the university system look like that um, intentionally focuses on building formational competencies? Um, and so, as we talked about earlier, that kind of knowledge and skill based competencies are almost being offloaded into other areas, and the university still has um, something that no other institution can offer, and that is the formational competencies. Okay, so the university would still have to deal with these testable competencies, so what would they kind of look like? So, here we have someone who's looking at their testable competency that's both quantitative and practical. This could be a competency in computer science through Code Academy or something like that, but it also could be a competency in like economics at Georgetown. Um, so this student would get these individual little competency bubbles when they master a skill. So initially it might be something like supply and demand model or comparative advantage or understanding market equilibrium. Um, but as the student grows, 
the competencies are very easily testable, so they grow very quickly. A student could take a summer and do like a summer experience in econometrics if they felt like it, and could gain two or three competencies in like understanding OLS regressions and how to interpret p-values, and then bring those back to Georgetown because they're easily testable, um, and then gain another competency in something like econometric modeling of game theory or something like that. But at the same time, they're also growing these other testable competencies because you know you're not just going to do one thing at Georgetown. It's a diverse community with diverse people and diverse opportunities. So you would also be focusing on competencies that are quantitative and creative, more like design or qualitative and creative that might be like um, creative writing or literature or something like that. Um. Uh, so another piece of the new university system would be network partnership. So here is a student that enters university. And what you're basically offered as soon as you enter a university, such as Georgetown or any traditional university, is that you're given the opportunity to network with people. Whether well, that's your peers, your faculty, or you know, coaches, club members, et cetera, et cetera. So as soon as you enter, you're given this opportunity to meet people. And as you go through university, you gain these, you know, these connections through classes, through uh, taking, you know, meeting different people, joining different clubs, uh, et cetera, et cetera, work. So, Currently, uh, mentorship is really, when we think of mentorship, we think of as one student and one mentor. However, we're not a hierarchical like, society anymore. As you guys know, we've sort of moved into a network flat society, and therefore, watching the mentorship is all the same trend, in that it should also be network. So instead of a student having one mentor, they have uh, mentors in either, they have faculty mentors, for example, peer mentors to their club groups that they're involved in, um, uh, bosses that they've had in the past through internships or through current you know, work that they're doing. And basically these mentorships would help a student grow in the sense that they help them guide their decision making that they're doing. It would help them um, basically, it would help you guide like guide the student through university in order to build competencies that they want to build. Um, and what we also said was that a network mentorship like this would allow you to be a more, it would basically allow for a more beefed up version of like LinkedIn endorsements, for example. So you'd be able to click on, um, if this was an output as like one form of a transcript as a student graduated, um, you'd be able to click on, for example, one of these lines and see what one of the mentors from a student organization, for example, had to say about the work that you did and what competencies you built in that and you know feedback about what work you did. Um, and basically this kind of gives uh, a student opportunities to show what competencies they built, not only in class, but in everything else that they do on that university campus. Um, Another possible outcome for that effort uh, mentorship model is something like this uh, inspired chart. Uh, these are five probational competencies that we felt were crucial to um, student X's development. Um, and the thing about these competencies is that they can be further broken down. So you would be able to go into let's say the resilience competency and see particular skills that people believe that this individual has developed over time. Um, and this is kind of the, like, the first model um, early on in the student's career where they've been doing mostly knowledge and skills based uh, competencies thus far and they haven't really gotten to the, uh, the larger class that really develop this position. As time goes on, these develop more. So for example, at this point in time, um, this student is taking uh, a lot of classes that deal heavily in collaboration, uh, really focusing on um, teamwork, team building, but at the same time, it's a lot of resilience, so perhaps they're being critiqued or the student is being critiqued on a regular basis, uh, and, and these formational com competencies continue to grow. Then finally, uh, after a significant amount of time, the student has developed a, a, bro a broader base of competencies overall ranging across the entire So kind of what does that process look like? So we took resilience, or resiliency is one of our competencies, and kind of broke it down into the pieces that may make up resiliency and how you would get or acknowledge that you do have that competency. So initially it would start with some guidance from your mentors, they could be peers, they could be faculty, advisors, whoever. Um, not really guidance to develop that competency, more guidance to like plan out your semester, what you're gonna do if you wanna emulate someone who you really think is like an awesome career track, you would talk to them and things like that. Um, and then through specific examples of things that you've done over the semester, you develop that competency, whether it's, whether you're aware of it or not. So an example would be like working with peers. So let's say this student 
is in Jugs and they're in charge of the budget for Juggernaut, which is a you know, huge budget, and you have to deal with an executive board and try to, you know, you have to go through multiple iterations of that budget because people are don't want I don't know X thing included. Um, so just going through that and working with people and revising would help build your resiliency. Taking a class or working on a project, much like the ones that we do here, where you have to go through multiple iterations, you have to accept criticism. And rather than just handing in paper, getting your criticism and like leaving it at that, getting a B and leaving, you have to then change your implementation, change your project, and respond to that criticism, which would also show resiliency. So you go through that like arc to the top. Um, and then when it says present to multiple mentors, it's not like a formal presentation, but more of a conversation that you have with people um, that are important in your life that can kind of go through what you've done in the semester, um, talk to you about it, and they help tease out kind of the personal development that, that has happened in that semester, which is where you realize like, oh, I've developed like this in my leadership skills, or I've really become more able to take criticism and very resilient in that way, um, which is where the evaluations come in. These people that you have the conversations with would be able to speak to your character, your development, your actual like presentations or projects or whatever you created, and then that would go back into um, what Sumi talked about with those like LinkedIn connections, as well as back into the um, formational competency tracker that Justin showed. Yeah. So basically this would basically just show exactly what I said in the process, and the three things that we showed, uh, the sort of the skills and knowledge based bubble competencies, the network mentorship uh, uh, picture that we showed, and then as well as the key map, those would be three outputs, and that would be three versions of the transcript that students would be able to basically present to any outside employee, grad school, or even for especially for themselves to use to figure out you know, what they've done in the past few years. Uh, so as far as uh, further work is concerned, you guys probably noticed that we didn't talk really at length about how that data is going to be collected, uh, but we do. We feel pretty confident um, that the university is going to have to focus on these formational competencies and having legitimacy to that. That is offload and continues to be a trend when it comes to just still knowledge-based competencies. Because um, the knowledge, or, sorry, the uh, formational competencies are still something collection is the first bullet point here. Um, and then also the university could possibly partner with some of those uh, third parties that are specializing in skill and knowledge based dispositions um, to kind of adjust in that way. And then uh, lastly, the, the offloading process, uh, it's not entirely clear how the university is going to adjust to that. You know, are they just going to slash the departments entirely? Or as we pointed out earlier, they could use the, the resources that they have to kind of partner with an existing um, an existing kind of institution. Any questions or yeah. um, for the area where you show like uh, the collaborative resilience, like the graph yeah. for that, mm -hmm. um, is it based on the relative growth from when you start, or is it like a fixed rubric of an amount you achieve? Because I can see like relative being useful for like a personal aspect, mm -hmm. but also being more difficult for say an outsider evaluating it. It's, it's hard to measure a person's growth versus. Right, yeah, so hopefully it would be exactly like what we showed here, where maybe so if you had some sort of uh, slider where you showed a student's progression from year one all the way to how long they choose to stay in university. Um, so exactly, exactly it would be to show the student's growth, just because every student is different, every student learns differently, every student has a different reaction to you know, resilience and growth. Whereas the small bubbles for skills and knowledge, that would be kind of like easy to tell, okay, the student has X. So on, on the uh, the beefed up LinkedIn, yeah, that is, is it. Um, so people who we consider to be mentors or whatever part of our life, we deem that appropriate, they're going to be required to write something about me. So I mean, it's not something that's required. It's something that I mean, you would ask the people that you consider to be in that position. Um, it could also be something that's required. Kind of already in place, but it's not exactly very rigid. So even though 
um, I have a mentor through an internship that I really rely a lot on. That's not necessarily reflected in, in any kind of transcript or resume that I might have pulled. Also, faculty might have more time to do this if the skills and knowledge courses that we talked about are kind of offloaded into either online courses or smaller boot camps. So they will like ho hopefully have more time to write you, for example, a recommendation or actually show you know how you did on the next project. Uh, just to clarify, did you say that this graphic here, this sort of model, would be also used as sort of like a resume to potential employers? Yeah, so hopefully you have like three outputs. So if you have a student page, for example, you'd have the skills and knowledge that you know, the, your network basically that has endorsements or references, whatever, as well as your personal uh, Does that network only really extend to like your, your first person connections, or does that also include like sort of like just sort of the peripheral areas that are also? I think it would open it would be more uh, first person yeah, yeah. Well, because these are these are really people that you dealt with on a personal level that would be okay, because, of, because on the graphic it shows right like people I mean, yeah. yeah. Um I think I think it would be mostly first person on the graphic. People that you've dealt significantly with, uh, mostly faculty, peers, and um, okay. employers. Um, and particularly this would kind of be reflected in that spider chart that we have of each other. I was going to ask, is there a mechanism other than just sort of organically coming across a mentor? Is it something that I think that what I found uh, with my own experiences, these experiences, I think a lot of my friends, mentors sometimes can happen randomly and sometimes cannot happen at all. So I'm wondering if you guys have thought about uh, maybe some sort of way that would encourage mentorship, especially when it's playing such a central role. Uh, in the grand scheme of your system. Yeah, so something we've talked about is um, going back to like, all the way back to the POV projects. Um, with all the offloaded knowledge that we have here, that would be kind of your basic intro level courses. Um, things where you're really doing like work memorization and um, really basic skills. Uh, and I think with all that offloaded knowledge, there would be more professors available to serve that in a mentor role and maybe be assigned to smaller groups of students to meet with on a bi-weekly or tri-weekly basis, just to kind of keep tabs and build a relationship with them over time. Um, and that, that could be a, a faculty member that's not the same discipline at all, or a faculty member uh, within some major, or uh, any kind of faculty yeah. And then that's also like, maybe a student president, of, or sorry, a club president may be required to have like or something just to make it more rigid, but that's something we have to figure out more. Yeah. I think the also like the importance of mentorship is definitely something the university recognizes now, but it's not our like, main focus. Um, so it's just like you said, it's kind of assumed that they'll just kind of happen and hopefully it ends up well for everyone. But in this history, that's actually like the focus is that network of mentors. Um, hopefully the university will be able to come up with uh, a better way that's just being said kind of adding some rigidity. Maybe there's some sort of like, so for each student, like their network of mentors would also be, you can want to be single conversations with your mentor, for example, maybe you have like group mentorship meetings where you have your club president meeting with you, you have your faculty member all giving you feedback at the same time, or also that they're sharing data so that you know, maybe they're on the same page. But also it might help that they're coming from different angles so that you have like, like some more like,
thousand students with maybe ten advisors, ten deans, um, versus having like a mentor for a small group of people, and that mentor is dedicated to checking in with this person, professors or uh, peers or people, or club leaders that this person is a part of. Yeah. Hey, um, so I was just wondering if you guys have done any kind of research to see if this would improve students' experience in universities. Um, and the reason why I'm wondering that is because I would be really uncomfortable with having every aspect of my social life quantified by external people. Um, so just have, have you asked that question? Have you gathered any data about whether this would actually improve a student's experience? I think we could definitely do like some sort of survey, but I think it wouldn't be necessarily that all your social life is tracked. It'd be more that you're picking specific mentors that you're like, very involved with. So it wouldn't be everyone you're dealing with, but maybe people that you find important, people that you find could give you guidance. So it's more for that guidance, not for the social. Life. So the student gets to build this map that's around them? They select the people? Okay. But yeah, I think a survey. So it definitely seems like you need to somehow visually put together the network diagram, the spider diagram, and this art diagram. Because I am just too stupid to figure out how the three of them mesh. Like they each make sense to me, although yeah. I don't quite get the art. But but I can see how it's each a piece of what you're thinking. So but I do think you need to in your, your further iteration is like how does the network build the competencies, or how is the network a network of competency inputs, and how does that network of competency inputs help it? something else happen? Yeah. So I, I know you, these are all new pieces, so I think you could just leave. In a few minutes, yeah. Wait, how old is it? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> gosh. Jesus. Okay. <laughs> how long has it been since they started that? So we'll, okay, so we'll wrap in two or three minutes. Okay, so you have 15 questions, 15 questions. <laughs> up to 15, up to, yeah, 12 plus, yeah. What? 12. Okay, 12, all right. <laughs> you have two minutes left. Are you happy? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody cut Abby off. Um, I want to ask the class, though, so you all asked really good questions, but I want, I want to get people to say, what about what they're doing seems most exciting or most interesting? What is it that you think is the thing that you would want to press on or do? Like, you ask really good questions, now say something specific. 
to them, what do you think is the most important thing that you saw there that you don't want them to lose? Or if you'd like to turn it around, I was just trying to be positive. And since we have so little time left because of Abby's time management, you could also <laughs> say, what is it you think that they most need to work on between now and the second? But let's quick, just you know, kind of a lightning round of comments. Yeah. I think I really like the fact that you guys sort of separate the competencies into the more quantifiable slash rectangle ones versus the more valuable or more key one. I just think that in a way that the definition needs to be clearer. And also I guess the so what of it too. So what's the point of separating that and how that impact the model? Yeah. Uh, your, the, the, the big changes that I see is the uh, creation of the competencies uh, as, a, as a measurement and the essentially the leading of the one-on-one -on -one classes and the off-loading rather than still what you guys use. Uh, and uh, what I don't see is the larger impact that has on our current university system and what you want it to ultimately um, and I think if you could bridge that gap for me, uh, I, I would be happy. I think one thing to work on is to realize that some of the larger competencies um, depend upon skills and lower level competencies. So when you're, for example, with economics, right? You can, I think it was the last time, you can run like a direction and say that, that no one would get pushed out to collect and how or which question to ask is just an important one. Um, so it's also a matter of kind of what about the unquantifiable competencies that go beyond just like collaboration. We have that as a conceptual equation of competencies, but it's kind of like working on that. I think it's also figure out what to do with that and how to do it. Just a quick question about that. Wait, so are you, I'm excited, can I say something? I'm excited to see the one visualization you make that synthesizes all three of those. And I would suggest it's strange that you don't do it in a format of any like, existing information design. If you use a network, you use it. I always forget what the other part is. There's a line. Um, those all exist. So you use Thank you.